So today we are going to learn one of the first and incredibly powerful tools for circuit analysis, and that is Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, and how it relates to nodal analysis. And that is, again, one of the most important ways that we can actually solve complicated circuits. So Kirchhoff's current law, first Kirchhoff is the name of some German dude that came up with this law, is basically the conservation of charge. And that is that no matter how much current goes into a node, that same amount of current has to go out. So with, again, Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, we can imagine that we have a node right here and we have uh, different things coming in and out. And then we'll just say, all right, we have this is I1 going in, have I2 going out, I3 going out, I4 going in, and I5 going in. So with this concept, the idea is that no matter what is going on, the sum of all of those is equal to zero. So we can put this mathematically, which is incredibly important for KCL. We can say that at this node, we have I1 going in, so that's a positive I1. And then we have I2 going out, so that's a negative I2. I3 going out, negative I3. I4 going in, so positive I4. And I5 going in. So positive I5, and that all equals to zero. And so with this concept, this basic premise, we can come up with nodal analysis, where we use this property to figure out the current going in and out of each node, and then using that, set up some mathematical, mathematical equations, and with those mathematical equations, we can solve for each of those currents and all of the voltages involved in everything. So one of the cool things about this is that right now when I did this, I arbitrarily said, no, let's say I1's going in, I2 is going out, I3. And I created this based on that arbitrary assumption that I just threw in there. When we are actually doing the analysis, it's almost as arbitrary. You will want to look at it and just say, okay, I think that the current is flowing this way just because then it'll make more sense intuitively. But whenever you do this, you can find out, well, I said I3 is um, leaving, but if we get I3, we calculate it out, and I3 equals negative 5 amps, then we know that in reality, I3 is going in 5 amps. And so we just, all we have to do is when we are looking at this, we say current is flowing out, flowing in, depending on what we want, but make sure the signs of our math align, and then no matter what happens, it all comes out in the end by either giving us a negative number if we made the wrong assumption or a positive number if we made the right assumption. And again, even then, it's not necessarily right or wrong, it's just, it's different than our assumption because negative three amps, or excuse me, negative five amps going out is the same as positive five amps going in. So with that, this is the basic concept, the concept of conservation of charge that no matter what happens, current flowing in and flowing out will all equal zero. So with that, I have five steps and they're steps that I've come up with and they are obviously very, very similar to other people's, but I have a couple more um, psychological steps in there because I know some of the challenges that I've had doing circuit analysis. And let's just go over those five steps and then we're going to do two samples uh, to just give you an idea of how it works in reality. And then also we have done some more samples on circuitbread.com. So there is a write-up on circuitbread.com that uh, we've done to give you another perspective and another way of phrasing and stuff to teach the same concept and then even more samples. So if the samples that we go over here aren't enough to make it really intuitive or make it great, you can go over there for additional samples. So with that, let's go over the five steps that I have for solving circuits with KCL. There we go. Okay, so I created this sample circuit right here to go over the five steps. And first we're gonna go over them conceptually and I'll just mention them and kind of roughly go over and then we'll actually go over through the same circuit and actually do the math and figure everything out. So the very first thing you do when you come to a circuit is you take your time. Just take your time, look at what you have, look at the information you've been given and start to get an idea of what, what you should be expecting. Um, this is also a great time to establish the reference flows. So as I mentioned earlier, you can say, hey, the current's going this way or current's going that way. This would be a good time to do those sorts of things. So as we look at this one in particular, we see we have three resistors, two current sources. And since this current source is in series with that, and this current source is in series with that, we don't really need to calculate anything at this node. So here we, we can tell that only thing we really need to worry about 
is what's happening at this node. This is the only node that we don't know what's going on. So now that we've looked at this, we've looked, hey, we've got the resistances here, we've got the currents here. This is gonna be pretty straightforward. We just need to figure out this one thing. Also, since the currents are flowing that way, we can assume that we're gonna say the current flows that way there. We can assume the current's gonna flow that way there. And then we're gonna assume the current is flowing that way there. So again, the very first step is just take a look at it from a higher level, see what do I have here? What am I doing? Take a deep breath and just work your way through it. Because as you start identifying what you have and what you're expecting to get, then a lot of things come together. Whereas sometimes I know how I was as, a, as an undergrad, you'd look at it and you just kind of panic, like there's, there's so much going on here. I don't know, I don't know. Just breathe, calm down, you'll be okay. So the second thing is find your reference ground. Honestly, the vast majority of the time, people will give you a reference ground. And frankly, almost every time you see this, especially in real life designs, people put the ground at the bottom because that just makes the most sense. That is the way we all do it. And even though it's not an official standard, that is the way people think about it. However, if you have a tricky teacher or something like that, they might say, oh, you know, I'm gonna ground this right here. I'm gonna make this the ground point and that's gonna change things up and then you're gonna have to approach this differently. But since nobody's telling us where we need to put ground on this one and nobody has assigned ground, I would just say that second step would be to put reference ground right there. The third thing that you're going to do is going to be starting to write equations for each node or for each branch. So right here you can tell, okay, I'm gonna have a voltage over R3, so we could even just call that V3. You're just going to have voltage is equal to the current through it times the resistance of R3. R1 and R2, you could figure out the voltages across those, but honestly, we know what they are because of the current through there. So that's pretty straightforward, but this is the time, that third step is putting those equations for each single one of the elements and making sure, again, that depending on how you identified that flow, that you are making your equations match that flow or else you're gonna confuse yourself. Step four is simply taking those equations and making them, putting them together for each node. So if you have an equation for the current flowing through there, the equation current through there, equation of the current through there, we know at this node that it's gonna equal zero. So you're just gonna say I1 plus I2 minus I3 equals zero. So that's what you're doing in step four is you're taking those equations that you used for each branch and putting them together into that KCL, into that Kirchhoff's law where you know that it's going to equal zero. And then the fifth step is basically taking those equations, either the single equation or all the equations and solving for it. Now, this is a single step. And the last step, step four and step five, are the most crucial steps in this entire process. Number four, you have to make sure that your equation is set up right. You have to make sure that it's uh, aligning with the flows that you assigned, or it's just not going to work. No matter how good your math is, you're going to have the wrong answer if you assign it incorrectly. And then finally, just working your way through the math is where most of us make our mistakes. It's where most of us screw up is our just algebra. I don't know how I can have several years of calculus, differential equations, all that stuff under my belt, under my belt, and still screw up on algebra. I just do not understand it. So at this point, it's really good to try and solve it algebraically. And then if you have the time, if you have the capability, jump on the LT spice, set this circuit up. This circuit should only take you a couple of minutes to set up at most on LT spice to make sure that the numbers you get match this. Or if you did it algebraically, set it up so you can put it into some sort of matrix calculator and find out if your answers are matching that way. So you have multiple ways you can check the answers. And each one of these ways of solving it are very, very valid. And they're probably really great practice to have. Even if you can just do one when you're doing it in your test because of lack of time or lack of access to tools or things like that, it's still great to do all of them because that means you're gonna get a better intuitive sense of what's going on. And you're also just gonna have a bigger, um, a bigger set of tools in your toolbox. I also like to, at this point, if you haven't checked with multiple tools, kind of do an intuitive sense of, does, do, do these numbers make sense? If I can't do two solutions to say, hey, I got 25 milliamps here, 25 milliamps there, that means that everything's good. If I only have time to do one solution, say, that's 25 milliamps, does that make sense? I mean, shouldn't that be going the other way? But in my sense, just take the time to think over your solution and think if it makes sense. And that will really, really help you. So now that we've gotten over those, um, just from a theoretical point of view, let's actually go through them and actually do it with this problem. 
So again, first, we're just taking our time, we're looking at it, we're assigning flows, and we're figuring out what's going on. As I mentioned, we know that 5 amps is going through there, 10 amps is going through there, and so this is really our only unknown at, the point, at this moment. But I would assume that I'm going to have a current flow right there, and I'm going to call it I1, because for me, it's simpler when your R1 is equal to your I, I1. It's the same one because, man, that gets confusing when you don't do that. I'm going to assume that I2 is flowing that way. I'm going to assume that I3 is flowing that way. And then for my second step, I'm basically just going to, as I mentioned, say nobody's assigned me a reference ground, but I'll assume that that is my ground down there. Okay, for step three, I can, depending on how I want to set up the equation, since I'm saying that my current is flowing that way, I can say plus or minus that way. So I could say, again, always have my Ohm's law in the corner. I could say that V1 equals I1 times R1. And so knowing that, just looking at it, I already know what I and R is, so I should be able to find V1. And then do the same thing over here. Since I'm assuming that that's plus minus right there, I'm going to have V2 is equal to I2 times R2. And then finally, since I'm assuming current flowing down there, I'm going to say V3, the voltage across this resistor right there, is equal to I3 times R3. Now, at this point, since we already know what the current is through those two, we could also just say, well, we know that I1 is equal to 5 amps, and I2 is equal to 10 amps. But if we didn't have, if we had a voltage source there instead of a current source, we wouldn't be able to make that simplification and we'd have to use these equations right there. So now let's go to step four, which is setting up our equation right here. So we know that I1 plus I2, because we are assuming both I1 is going in and I2 are going into this node, minus I3 equals zero. Now I did this as a very, very simple thing as you will notice in just a moment, just to get us through the process. So don't laugh when I show you how simple this is. But again, we already know I1, so that is basically five plus I2 plus 10 minus I3 equals zero. So five plus 10 equals I3 and 15 equals I3. And that's it. So again, this is an insanely simple um, example, but that is basically how it's done. And this makes sense. I mean, again, 15 amps, you know that your 10 amps have to be going through this, five amps have to be going through that. Where's that current gonna be going? It's gonna be going through there. So we know it's just gonna be 15 amps. So that's something where, depending on your level of uh, understanding with circuits, you could have just looked at this and been like, oh yeah, I3 is 15 amps going down. And you could have skipped all of those steps and saved yourself a lot of time. But if you're not at that point yet, this is a good way to show how mathematically and um, intuitively you can put those things together to get the right answer. So that is our first sample. Let's jump into a second sample. Okay, so we've set up the second sample, and this one is obviously just a little bit more complicated. Let's just jump right into it. I, I think this will be a great example of showing something that you can't as easily just solve by inspection, but benefits from the extra power that you get with KCL to do the analysis. So let's do our first step, which is again, breathe, see what we have, see what we don't have, and um, kind of figure out where we think things are gonna go. So we only have one current source here, and that is flowing up this way. We have three resistors, and so even though we have a current here, we actually don't know the voltage here anymore because this current is gonna be split between this 200 ohm and 500 ohm resistor. Just in case this is not clear, that's R1 with 500 ohms, R2 200 ohms, and R3 with 100 ohms. So we now have two nodes that we care about, and we are going to be sharing a voltage across these two because these two resistors are in parallel, and then these two resistors in parallel could go into series. So again, going back to the tutorial that we had on series and parallel um, simplification, you could very easily simplify this and then it would just be a current source and one thing. But if you need to know specifically the voltage across R3 or specifically the current through R2, you can't do that simplification. So we can't do that right now. So as part of our first step, I'm also going to say that I am assuming that I1 is gonna be going that way, and also that I2 
is going to be going that way, and I'm going to assume that I3 is going to be going that way. So we can see that we're going to be having three currents here going in and out of this node and three currents here going in and out of that node. So our second step is just to identify reference ground, which we know, or we don't, again, we could put reference ground wherever we want, but to make things simple, let's just put it down at the bottom. And then for step three, this is where we're going to start, start writing the equations for these different, um, these different branches. So the equation here, since I'm assuming current flow that way, I'm gonna have my voltage like that. So for R1, I'm just going to have, and as always, I've put Ohm's law in the corner because I'm visual like that. So I'm gonna have my voltage for that equal voltage across one. It's going to be times I1 equals R2 times I2. And then for I3, I'm gonna have, oh, why am I messing things up? Times I3. Now we know that R1 is 500 ohms, we know that R2 is 200 ohms, and R3 is 100 ohms. So we can put these in and solve for I basically. So this I1 is now going to be V1 over 500. I2 is now going to be V2 over 200, and then I3 is going to be, oh boy, there we go, V3 over 100. And it's always good to have our units in there. Now, again, as we mentioned, we know that V1 is the same as V2, so we could even just simplify that and just say, I2 equals V1 over 200. Okay, so now we have our equations, and let's set up the big equation, the KCL, where everything equals zero. So we're going to have two equations here. We're gonna have one for right there and one for right there. Let's just call that node one and then node two. So the equation at node one is going to simply be 10 amps, because you know you're gonna be adding that, minus I1, minus I2 equals zero. And then for node two, we are going to have I1 plus I2 minus I3 equals zero. And then we just go in and we substitute what we know there. So we've got 10 amps minus V1 over 500 minus V1 over 200 equals zero. And then we have, for this one, we have V1 over 500. And I'm forgetting my units, I'm sorry. That's actually surprisingly important as you get to be better at this and get to be, become more intuitive. Then if you get your units mess, messed up, then you, you'll just, wait, wait, I did something wrong because those should have canceled out or that should have combined to do this or something along those lines. So V1 over 200 ohms, then minus V3 over 100 ohms equals zero. Okay, now the interesting thing here is we have two unknowns, V1 and V3 in this case, and we have two equations. So the way this is gone, it's actually simplified itself to make it even easier so we don't have to do a whole lot of substitution. But here we go through and we just say, okay, Let's put these all together so we can put this equation in reference to V1. And then once we solve for V1, we can take that over here, put it in for V1, and then put it all equal to V3. And then we can know what V1 is and V3 is. And then once we know what those voltages are, we can very easily, using Ohm's law, solve for the currents through um, R1 and R2. Even though, if you haven't noticed by now, I3 is going to be 10 amps because we've got 10 amps coming in here. And again, it has nowhere else to go other than through there. So that's something that you could use looking at it and say, hey, well, I already know that I3 equals 10 amps. So you could just put that in there and make things even simpler for yourself. I'm just going to put that out there. So I don't like doing math in my head or in front of people, but uh, let's, let's see if we can do this. So 10 amps equals 
V1 over 500 plus V1 over 200. And so you probably want to put that, oh my gosh, why, why, why am I doing this to myself? So we can just look at that and we can say, all right, that's going to simplify to common denominator 1000. So that's basically going to be, uh, let's see, 2V1 plus 5V1 over 1000 and multiply that over. So that ends up being a lot, 10,000 amps equals 7V1. So V1 equals, yeah, that's going to be big, 10,000 amps over 7 volts, excuse me, just over 7, gives us V1, which comes out to be 10,000 divided by 7, 1,429, basically, 1,429 volts. It's a lot of volts. Um, that's pretty crazy. So with that, we can stick that number in here and solve for V3. So let's do that really quick. Um, that might actually be even more complicated. Let's just get rid of all of that denominator right there and just say that is 2V1 plus 5V1 minus 10V3 equals 0. So that gives us a 7V1 equals 10V3. So that means that V3 is like 7 tenths V1 equals V3. So whatever those two are, let me punch that in really quick. Oh yeah, of course it is. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Which honestly, I, I should have even thought about this. Again, I, get, I just got caught in the numbers, but 7 tenths times that actually comes out to V3 equals 1000. So just an even 1000. And why is that? Because our resistance is 100 ohms and it's 10 amps. So as we know from Ohm's law, if our current is 10 amps and our resistance is 100 ohms, then our voltage is going to be 1000 volts. And so I should have known that. And I even mentioned it earlier, but again, this happens to me. I think it happens to a lot of people where you start getting in and you start chugging the numbers and then you don't know at what point they actually kind of make sense and what point they don't. But um, it's, it's really important to make sure that, oh, hey, this actually fits with that and this all goes together. So I'm glad, I'm glad this actually worked out that my math wasn't too horribly screwed up. I was extremely nervous about that while I was doing this, that I was gonna mess up my math and it's gonna come up to be something horrible. So it all came out nice and beautiful and it's great. And again, if I wanted to double check this besides just intuitively saying, yes, that makes sense because I expect 10 amps through that, I can throw this into LT Spice. I can set this up in a different way and just put this into a matrix calculator and figure it out. But um, we'll worry about that later. I do want to say that if you have any questions about super nodes, which is basically just a, um, a voltage source that isn't tied to reference ground, you're going to have to treat it differently. I'm not going to get into it in the video, but we do talk about it in the tutorial on circuitbread.com. So please go check that out if you have any questions about that. Also go check that out because we have a couple of more, a couple more samples of how this is done all laid out in nice steps. So hopefully this is helpful and this was a good introduction to KCL and will give you a good intuitive feel of exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it and why it's important to realize that no, uh, that your net current is going to be uh, zero in and out of each one of these nodes. If you did like it, please give it a like. If you have any questions, either leave a comment down below or on circuitbread.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Subscribe to our channel, keep following us. We have a lot of cool stuff to talk about with these basic circuits tutorials, and we will catch you in the next one.